Terrence Pop here with another episode of Live from the Lair! And today I'm going to be uh, doing a little update on the Ukraine situation. Now, as we all know, <clears throat> they've been duking it out now for almost two weeks. All right, and just like I predicted um, when this first started, uh, if the Ukraine was able to stall the Russian forces long enough, you'd start seeing what's happening now. Uh, the Russians, their momentum is, for the most part, stalled, and the gains they're making now are a slog, and they're being resisted at every turn. So, I don't know who Putin had in his staff, you know, recommending this course of action, because... Uh, I think Putin is the victim of having a staff of yes men that tell you what you want to hear. They don't tell you the truth. And uh, now the Russian forces are and the Ukraine are paying the price. Have you ever wondered what a world run by leftoids would look like? It would be a living nightmare. All employees with a criminal record are now entered into the lottery. The winners are allowed the honor of sacrificing their lives to decrease CO2 emissions. People are okay with that? But it turns out that the best way to stave off Marxism is to mock it relentlessly and creatively with movies like Tag Conspiracy. And now with only a 15 to 20 percent discharge error rate. Whistleblower Brett Mauser is back with his most hilarious and cinematic effort to date. And you can support free speech films like this by going to notsosane.com. Yeah, let's do this. Rent or buy a copy today. A link is in the meat gazer box. All right, now this is a map here. This is uh, three days old. Let me go here and show it. All right, uh, there has been some gains made in the past three days, but it's really, really slim. All right, um, they're starting to get that stranglehold here on Kiev and uh, and Kharkiv over here. Is that, yeah, these are the two major, major cities that are getting hammered at this time. And Crimea has come forward and grabbed most of this territory here. And as you can see, they're trying to move their way forward. And I believe that, uh, you know, they wanted the whole country, but I think they're, they want to unite these two forces. And then uh, I think they will have to try to get a ceasefire and keep half of this, uh, of the Ukraine. Now, the reason I'm saying that is... Um, a lot of the vehicles that were in these depots were not maintained properly. There's a lot of uh, equipment that's failing. And uh, the fact that they had let's say, somewhere between 65% of their force in a convoy moving into the country that is was stalled for multiple days. And this has really put a bind on the amount of fuel they have and can use. So you know, we have uh, fuel problems, we have maintenance issues, uh, there's a command and control problem, and most of that stems from the confusion between conscript units and their active duty frontline um, units that are not con you know, made of conscripts. Uh, historically, conscript armies are slow to react. <clears throat> they uh, put forth a minimum effort and to make them do anything, you have to have whip crackers standing over them to make sure it happens. Now, when everything gets spread out and you don't have that happening, no one's there uh, cracking the whip over the conscripts, uh, this, is what, this is what you uh, see. Um, this is warfare being waged at a 60% standard. Okay, so basically these conscripts are engaging, you know, six out of 10 Ukrainians and in my opinion they're just trying to get through it to get over it all right so that's the map right there stand by on the next one okay now there's been a lot of uh, rumor control out there that the ukrainian government is shooting its own people 
uh, and tries to get them out of a war zone. Now, this takes place for the most part uh, to the west of Ukraine where they had the few provinces that are majority Russian speaking who wanted to basically become part of Russia. And since 2014, uh, Zelensky has been uh, bombing and, uh, you know, basically applying artillery to the individuals in that portion of, quote unquote, his country. Like I said before, there is no black and white here. Our media is trying to, you know, paint Ukraine as the white knights and Russia as the black knights doing evil shit. Uh, in my opinion, they're both uh, in different shades of gray. Now, granted, Russia started this whole thing uh, by, you know, coming into the border. But I uh, think moving forward, you know, as more news comes out, we're going to find out a lot more dirt of what's been going on in the Ukraine. And there's a lot of scuttlebutt about bioweapon labs and uh, vaccine testing on Ukrainian troops. And... We have members of our own government who own buildings over there and have members of their uh, family on the Ukrainian boards for, you know, energy, which is absolutely stupid. It's not just our stunning and brave um, Richard Potato in charge, but uh, individuals from the Democratic Party um, who have sons that are doing the same thing. And we'll probably do a story on it later on, but it needs to be spoken about. And uh, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm expecting hackers of, you know, I, I don't even know which hackers would do this. Anonymous, I know there's a whole bunch of hackers out there just making trouble for Ukraine and Russia. And when that happens, you can probably expect to see a large spill of information into the public domain in the next uh, one to six months. This is another journalist uh, who's speaking about... Uh, inside you know eastern ukraine i believe that's yeah that that's where the two uh, provinces wanted to pull away from the ukraine and uh the people in those areas are grateful russia's finally doing something uh there's a video here this is basically you can find this on raiirfoundation.com raiirfoundation.com and it talks all about uh, the crazy shit that's going on. They even have, um, they're accusing Zelensky of being a Nazi, you know, neo-Nazi kind of uh, regime. Now, it's hard to determine who's right, who's wrong, <clears throat> because there's the fog of war going on, and everyone and their mothers is basically doing propaganda. You got Ukraine doing their version of propaganda. You have the Russians doing theirs. And then you have the Western nations. <clears throat> and then you have the United States. All of them are putting forward different stories. So it's going to be really hard to determine who's telling the truth. And in the future, moving on, as more information comes to light, you use logic and reason, and you can pretty much shine right through the fog of their uh, propaganda. So I'm going to go through shoulder-fired weapons that are now flooding into the Ukraine. Okay, this, is, this includes Stinger missiles uh, from various, uh, basically, shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles. The ones from the United States are called Stingers. And um, they've been, you know, Ukraine has received uh, anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles from virtually... Uh, every nation that touches them, that's part of NATO. Okay, and to include ones that aren't even there, like Spain, the Netherlands, England, France. So this is going to get lively. And, and this is going to change the doctrine of warfare moving forward. Okay, um, the uh, massive amounts of artillery and air cover and the armor advantage don't seem to be having the crushing results of uh, the lightning wars of the past. And a lot of that is because <clears throat> the shoulder-filed you know, man-pad missiles are disrupting the total air superiority that uh, Russia wanted over the skies of Ukraine. 
Those man-pad uh, missiles go up to 15,000 feet. Now, in, I'm going to be honest, <clears throat> those are just the numbers that are released to the public. Um, I would add 20% on to that. So basically, um, it would be safe to assume at least the United States man-pad missiles probably have an upper ceiling of somewhere around 20 to 22,000 feet and probably an additional two clicks in range on their, mo on their rocket motors. Uh, you can find a lot of this information uh, open source online, but as a former, you know, 18 Bravo, <clears throat> you know, I've looked at the official pamphlets of what the weapon can do, and I've looked at the pamphlets that were released to the general public, and they were not the same. So I'm assuming that is probably the case here as well. All right, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna go through all this right now. This is on the dive. Dr the drive.com t-h-e-d-r-i-v-e.com and here's some pictures of the missiles that uh that are being uh shipped over now what i really you know as a side note i used to love getting my hands on the storage containers for stuff like this because I, I would use it for all kinds of cool stuff because most of the time you take the warhead out you throw away the dunnage and it just sits there and does nothing um that's very useful stuff, especially for insurgents. Uh, they can basically cache equipment, ammo, what have you, put it in these uh, containers and bury it. And it'll probably be good for up to five years, maybe longer, depending upon what they're made of and how much water is in the ground and how cold it gets. All right, Mad Pads. We got the FIM-92 Stinger. All right. When everyone says, you know, uh, shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles, the first thing people say, say is stingers. Okay, there are a lot of different types of stingers, and they started making them in roughly 1981, and they have gotten better ever since then. I believe a lot of the stingers that were originally given to the Ukraine were right on the cusp of expiring, so those were probably made in you know in the neighborhood of the 2005 to 2010 range because typically they don't like to keep this stuff on the shelf more than 10 years because there are components that oxidize and cause it to become extremely unreliable now this defect is i saw this a lot more in iraq with the sa7s and sa14 systems that uh, were all over iraq they were old, they were used against uh, incoming landing aircraft at victory. It's just the missiles lost their ability to track. And a lot of times they would, you know, fire out of the missile and then there's safeties built in where the, the missile uh, explodes at minimum arming distance because there's too many defects going on within the circuits. And it's just a built in, um, you know, safety measure. Now, not all shoulder-fired um, rockets or, or anti-aircraft missiles have that. Um, but they started putting it in there, you know, just for shits and giggles. Because guess what? Um, you want your missile to go to the target you aim it at. And in today's day and age, if your missile isn't capable of doing that, it does something else. It can cause an international incident. And there'll be all kinds of problems. That's probably one of the reasons why uh, they've deciding, you know, it, to put that uh, those kind of safety measures into these different missiles. All right, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. These are diff these are different uh, anti-aircraft uh, constructions. Now they're coming from all over. Okay, we have the Grom. This is basically an Eastern Bloc missile, and, and Poland basically sent a lot of these over there. Again, these are probably a little older missiles. The newer stuff will come as it's needed, and if the country is willing to part with those missiles, we shall see. Okay, it doesn't really go into the Grom's uh, maximum ceiling, but I can assume if it was made in the, ten, in the past 10 years, which um, as a gambling man... I'm betting probably most of these missiles uh, were made with between 15 and, and 10 years ago. 
So it's probably pretty close to the stinger because let's face it, if you make a good product, people copy it or they take it and tweak it a little bit to make it their own design and there you go. It happens all the time. Okay, here's the uh, Strela and the Igla. These are from Germany. And these are, they're sending over basically uh, 2,700 Soviet era heat seeking Sierra uh, series man pads. Now, I am basically going to tell you that these are probably not going to work. They're long since expired. And even if they do work, a lot of these, you know, if the aircraft is dropping flares, they're going to be virtually virtually ineffective i'm sure they'll still get some hits but it won't be like the newer uh the newer level stuff now don't get me wrong <clears throat> there's a way you can use these missiles to get a tactical advantage even though you know um they're probably not going to work well basically every aircraft has some type of radar on it and if it's coming into the battle space to drop some heat on your soldiers and you have these missiles in your inventory you basically squeeze a couple off the the aircraft don't know they're old and, and aren't going to work and this will really f with their uh, patterns to come in and drop ordnance because i'm gonna tell you right now i've spoken to a lot of pilots and uh coming in below you know three or four thousand feet to to drop ordnance um is a, it's a risky game with direct fire weapons and it becomes even more of a nightmare with guided munitions. So it could cause a lot of flinching on the enemy side. It's basically a bluff. But bluffs work in poker and they work in life and they work in war. Okay. Now we're talking about the Javelin here. Now the Javelin <clears throat> uh, is f***ing a super effective platform. I've fired it. I've seen it. I've seen it used, and uh, to be honest, the Russians know the javelin is incredibly effective because you're starting to see a lot of cages and blocking plates being loaded or being welded on top of the tanks. Um, now I do not know if those will be uh, effective because the javelin has a tandem warhead. The uh, the first one is designed to set off uh, reactive armor. And then the warhead behind it is the one that does all the damage. So that first warhead will probably blow a hole in whatever material on top of the tank is used to block it. And then the tandem warhead will, will basically blast through that and, you know, take the tank out, if not cripple it. Okay, we got the N-Law, which is the next generation um, anti-tank weapon system. I personally haven't uh, messed with this at all. It kind of looks similar to a dragon to me, but uh, or an AT4. I, you know, I I'm not really familiar with this weapon system, other than the fact it probably has the same penetration and capabilities as the newer AT4s. Meaning, uh, it has an extended range. It'll go through more armor, and you can set different uh, settings on the warhead for like anti-vehicle, anti-building, or bunker. So it has an effective range of uh, 26, 25 feet. Uh, divide that by three. It's like 1,200 meters-ish. It's not bad, just almost a mile. Now, these, unless it's guided, um, you know, guided anti-tank weapons, you can fire at those distances. If it's not guided, you're going to have to get closer, like three to 500 meters, if not closer than that. And whenever you get that close to uh, big rolling tanks that can run you over and make you sound like a, a box of saltine crackers and has weapons that'll shoot through pretty much anything you can hide behind, it gets pretty dicey. Carl Gustav came into the inventory just before I ETSed out of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. We were just starting to use it like the last five months I was there. And it was replacing the 90 millimeter recoilless rifle. Now this particular color, Gustav, I do not believe it has guided uh, guided ammunition nor fire and uh, fire and forget ammo. I believe it's a direct fire uh, round that you know can take out medium and light vehicles. 
Uh, they used it on bunkers, they used it on buildings, and they even have anti-personnel missiles. This thing is incredibly useful, and it, it, does, it has flares and smoke as well. This is a very, very good weapon system, and I'm glad it, I, they're, it's getting sent over to the Ukraine. All right, here's a picture of all the different types of rounds that uh, can be used. I'm not going to go through them all. Okay, Canada is sending some stuff. I, they're a base. I don't know if they're sending the Carl Gustav. Let's look. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. It's a Swiss. Oh, Canada is sending it to them. So it's a Swiss-made Carl Gustav, and uh, Canada is sending them all these those systems, which those are pretty good systems, and they're not super pricey because they're old. <clears throat> but you know, hey, Canada, they don't really do a lot of fighting. And it is what it is. Now, here we have the AT-4. Okay. Um, 5,000 of these have been sent over there. And uh, it's a Swedish-designed weapon. We have a whole ass load of them. Uh, I jumped one of these into Panama along with some law rockets. And uh, they did quite well. I believe... Um, I dropped off my AT-4 and two law rockets at the, uh, when I got to the assembly area along with all my other crap, uh, cause I was basically a walking, um, ammo pallet and it was used, I believe on some vehicles around the compound. I myself did not fire any, any of these at enemy vehicles. So I, I missed out on that, uh, that chance, but I have fired quite a few AT-4s, law rockets, a fire to tow a couple tow missiles, a couple javelins, um, fired, what is it, about a dozen anti-aircraft uh, shoulder-fired missiles in my career, and I've done a lot of training on these systems, and they're pretty goddamn scary. Now, this, you see this picture here, they, they have an ANPVS-4 night vision scope mounted on the side of this weapon. I say, when you fire this, this whole tube here is expendable so you just drop it and leave it but you know in the heat of battle some of these guys might actually leave this uh, piece of equipment behind uh because let's face it when adrenaline's pumping and shit's going crazy the little details here will fall through the cracks this is not a good idea in my opinion here's the panzer faust three um this one has a range of uh, 1,300 to 1,900 feet, which is like 800 to 1,200 meters. Uh, no, actually, that's uh, 400 to 600, 700 meters. Okay, there, there's a picture of that. Now, listen, all of these missiles getting dropped off for uh, Ukraine to use it's changing how we're going to conduct warfare moving forward. All right. Um, because when you have this many uh, missiles on the ground, your vehicles become incredibly vulnerable and we're going to they're going to have to try to come up with a way to, uh, to beat that. Uh, here we go. The M 72 anti-tank light armor, the law. You know, I trained on this in basic training. I've fired, I don't know, 100, 150 of these, and probably a, a thousand, two thousand of the training missiles. It's a good system. It's good for light vehicles. And if you volley fire on a like a heavier uh, armored vehicle, yes, you are not. You're probably not going to penetrate the armor. But you know, you get five, four, five, six guys volley firing on a tank from the side. You can easily get a mobility kill by, you know, destroying the road wheels or having it throw a track. And you, if you're lucky and you land anywhere near the breach of the chamber, you can damage the actual main gun and take it out of play. Let's see what else I got here. Okay, armor-piercing infantry light arm system. This is another, I think this one is from France. It's basically a, another version of an AT-4. And then this one here is from Spain. Again, it's another version of an AT-4. 
All right. Um, here's another Spanish one here. The C90 looks very similar to an AT4. So, like I said before, um, this is going to get ugly moving forward. Here are some headlines here from Ukraine, UKRA News. Okay, we have Russia tries possibility of ceasefire. We'll see. Um, Russia sabotage and reconnaissance groups are infiltrating Kiev and other major cities, and they're looking for military targets that are being stored near uh, civilian you know, basically civilian uh, buildings. Uh, and this is very common. They, uh, will, they will do this to protect their assets from artillery and air attack. And they hide behind uh, the population. Every army does this to a certain extent. Okay, um, that's just the way it is. We even did it in Baghdad to keep um, our tanks and, you know, logistic uh, vehicles from getting hammered. All right, so you're going to see a lot of uh, low-level fighting as these uh, groups are basically identified and the Ukrainians will try to pin them in place to kill and capture them. That, that's how war is, uh, that is how war is conducted. Now you see here the Russian troops are now identifying themselves with yellow ribbons like Ukraine troops are. This is, you know, this is under fog of war and causing confusion on the ground all right now technically this is against the geneva convention but you know since ukraine is not part of nato i don't know if it's uh i don't know if they're going to follow the geneva convention the way it should be followed and this is going to turn into a long drawn out brutal slog all right, now here we have Russia seriously considering blowing up ammonia warehouse in Kharkiv region to blame Ukrainian armed forces. All right, now, for those of you that don't know, this portion of the world creates a lion's share of the fertilizer for the world, and they make a good share of grain that uh, feeds, you know, half the globe. So, you know, we're going to see food shortages at a minimum for the next two to three years because of this no matter what happens and if this conflict continues to move along it's just going to get worse all right that's all i'm going to go through on that one i don't want to burn through the, all of them here okay again war in ukraine high level talks between russia and ukraine fail to make progress this is shocker uh basically putin wants the ukraine to agree to never become part of NATO or, you know, or join any other um, block of nations that stand against Russia. Uh, that's why I believe at a bare minimum, you know, instead of withdrawing um, the forces completely, uh, Russian forces from Ukraine, they're going to try to go north and just take half the country and just call it good. And then they're going to take a long time to retrain their military and refit it because uh what they're doing or what they thought was going to work isn't it's fucking brutal okay now this is uh russia's economy has taken a huge huge hit their stock market has been closed since the end of february and a lot of people are getting the fuck out of dodge and the Russian basically want to step in and endorse a plan to nationalize foreign-owned businesses that flee the country over its invasion of Ukraine. This is typical communist fucking type of bullshit. And um, this really, you know, I don't approve of this at all. Um, because I'm going to be honest, I think the world has had enough of communism. And if Russia is going to continue to use communist and socialist policies, they're going to get painted in that light, and it will not be good for them moving forward. Especially if they do anything like fucking way out of hand, they, they might not ever recover.